I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to my shop, aka the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to rebuild the top of my workbench. So I get started in the usual way of breaking down a few sheets of MDF, and in this case, two sheets of three quarter and one sheet of one inch thick MDF. What I'm building here is a torsion box, and really all a torsion box is is two outer layers separated by an inner grid work. And the strength comes from the glue line between the outer layers and the inner grid work. And this is a project I've tackled a handful of times now over the years. I usually rebuild the top of my workbench every three or four or five years. And once again, I find myself reaching out and thanking the YouTube community. There's a guy by the name of Ron Polk who in recent years has made a torsion box style workbench more popular. And I mention Ron because the cutouts that I'm going to add to the side of my bench where tools can be stored, uh, I got that idea from watching his videos. All right, so I use the biscuit joiner to help establish the perimeter, and this allows me to then glue and nail the internal structure without having the outside pieces flop all over the place. And because this torsion box is held together with glue and nails alone, the glue joint's real important, so I take time to spread glue around evenly, and I make sure there's a lot of glue on there. Also, I go back and I wipe off that bottom edge so that no squeeze out can occur down there gluing this piece down to the MDF that it's sitting on. But I would just like to mention that it's not the joinery between the grid work that makes a torsion box strong and rigid. What makes a torsion box strong and rigid is the glue line between the grid work and the outer layers. What I'm doing here is just creating a structure that can be moved around and not fall apart. A few more notes about torsion boxes in general. Torsion boxes make great workbench tops because they can be built very, very flat. And they can also be constructed from really inexpensive materials. I'm using MDF. But there's no reason why plywood wouldn't work. And they can be built to be light and portable if you used thinner half inch or 3 8 inch material. Or they could be built to be nice and heavy as I'm doing with this one here out of 3 quarter and 1 inch thick material. And I think even if you're a more traditional woodworker using a traditional cabinet maker's bench, I think a torsion box could be useful in your shop as a glue up, assembly, or a finishing bench. And I would suggest making it light enough and portable enough so that you can take it down and put it up against a wall when you're done. At this point, the grid work is all glued and nailed together and it's in a position where it's easily moved, but it's not yet glued down to the bottom piece. This is the point in the build where I get experimental. Because my workbench top is mounted on a scissor lift, I can't really put a shop vac under the bench for dust collection. So I thought I could use the motor out of a cheapy shop vac that I bought at a garage sale and install it in the torsion box itself. And this may seem a little over the top, but if you think about how often I'm using a tool and the fact that I stand at my bench virtually all day, um, having something that's really quick and convenient uh, really adds up over the course of a work day and then a work week and so on. So I wanted something that was quick and easy and that would help encourage me to use dust collection more often. Ultimately, I just cut the section of the lid where the motor mounts to it. Then I added a piece of half inch square tubing. I built this bracket and I used some silicone and screws to hold everything in place. At this point, I would just like to point out the really clean, smooth cut I made on the lid of that shop vac. As I mentioned earlier, this vacuum install is experimental, so all of these various components are easily removed. So if this ends up breaking or it doesn't work very good, I can just take all of this stuff out and the workbench will still function fine. Well, it passes the shake test, so you know it's good. And this was what I came up with to mount a standard rigid filter that I could get at Homey Depot.
And I fully realize in terms of chip separation and vacuum efficiency and yada yada yada, this is probably not the best design system on planet Earth, but if you think about what I'm going to be using it for, it's really only my biscuit joiner, domino, maybe a track saw once in a while. So in other words, I'm not going to be running a ton of dust through this. And I think for my small needs, this system will work pretty good. And I'm a little miffed here. I based the size of this opening on an old rigid filter that I had. Then when I went to go buy the new one, they'd slightly changed the exterior dimensions of it. So it's a tight squeeze, but it does fit. After fitting all the components, I was feeling cautiously optimistic and slightly less crazy. So the shop apprentice found a new favorite toy in the shop, and that's one of these wooden hand screws. He's kind of getting bored with the dustpan these days. With the vacuum install complete, I turned my attention to the cutouts on the side of the bench. And I get started by making a template that I'll clamp to the bench and I'll use a router to route this shape out of the sides of the bench. The shop apprentice is cutting his two-year-old molars right now, so he's been waking up a few times a night for the last few nights. And this is what I look like on about eight hours of sleep in two days. So, ah, there we go. That's a little better. And a quick word on safety. Not that I'm the safety police or anything, but I'll tell you what, the couple of times I've been hurt in the shop, it's because I was tired or I was trying to work too fast. After the templates, I rough cut with a jigsaw. And I have to say, these barrel style grip jigsaws are absolutely great. They really offer more control than a traditional handle. So immediately here, you'll notice the one downside to using a router and a template, and that is the insane amount of dust that's created. But this shot's actually a good illustration as to why I want to take the time to put a vacuum into my workbench, and that's I want to continually improve dust collection to keep my environment cleaner. And one mistake that I've made thus far in the build is I should have done these cutouts before gluing the grid work together so that I could have put a small round over on that inside edge. And now I'm marking the location of the grid work on the underside of the bottom piece. And I'm doing this so that during glue up, I'll know exactly where to nail. Tiny amount of glue on these biscuits just to hold them in place so they don't shift during glue up. And now I'm ready to glue the bottom on. So as I mentioned earlier, the glue line between the grid work and the outer layers is where a torsion box gets its strength. So this is real important. One side benefit of using biscuits for alignment purposes is the biscuits actually act as a standoff so that as I'm sliding this piece in place, I don't smear too much of the glue off. So I use a combination of 18 gauge brads and my massive body weight to kind of clamp everything in place while I'm nailing. And once the glue is dry, this thing will be rock solid. And now let's take a quick look back with me, Mike Farrington. One of the things that's very important when building a torsion box is you want to have a flat reference surface. So for me, building a torsion box on top of another torsion box is really easy. Well, I didn't always have a torsion box. So here are a few pictures from many, many years ago when I first started building torsion boxes and how I got a flat reference surface so that my torsion box would end up being nice and flat. And there are a million ways to do this, but ultimately a few sawhorses and some shims and a couple of extra sheets of plywood, and you can create a really flat surface. And a straight edge of the proper length, uh, something like a level, would work really well. And some playing cards, and you can create a surface that is dead flat. Now that the bottom is glued on, you might think, well, it's time to glue the top on. Well, it is, except I want to add one more feature to this bench before gluing the top on. And what you're looking at here is called the PARF guide system. And this little gizmo was invented by a spiffing chap named Peter Parfit. And what this is designed to do is create a grid of 20 millimeter dog holes that are accurately spaced. And as you go up and down the rows and columns, it creates perfect 90 degree angles. And before going any further, I want to mention that I paid for this system with my own money. And when I bought it, uh, I was completely anonymous. I made no mention of the fact that I had a YouTube channel or I would be featuring it on my YouTube channel. With that said, this product that kind of seemed a little gimmicky to me at first, 
Uh, I have to admit, it does exactly what it says it's going to do, and that's it creates accurately spaced 20 millimeter dog holes that create 90 degree angles. And as you could imagine, drilling all the holes is a little tedious, but I do think the payoff is worth it. All right, in a quick rundown of how this system works, you use the rulers that have accurately spaced three millimeter holes drilled into them to drill the grid work onto your bench. Then you come back with this, I guess you'd call it like a little mini drill press, and you enlarge those three millimeter holes. And what I find interesting is Peter Parfit sells this system as a way to create a track saw cutting station. But to me, that completely overlooks the fact that a 90 degree grid work can be used for a million different things, not just a track saw. So later in the video, you'll see that I created a couple of fences that allow me to use my biscuit joiner or a router or a domino to help assist cutting joinery in cabinets and furniture. And with that said, I don't have a ton of experience with this system. Really at this point, I have made my workbench top and I've done a handful of test cuts. But so far the test cuts have come out pretty good. But overall, I think this will be very helpful in building cabinets and furniture. And you'll see me using it in future videos if that's the case. And if all else fails, at least the shop apprentice really loves the packaging. And because this is one inch thick MDF, I needed to add a chamfer to the underside of the top so that the clamps can kind of fit in and make the turn. And now that all the dog holes have been drilled and routed, it's time to glue the top down. And after spreading the glue, I had a certain unnamed camera shy, brown haired, beautiful woman off to the side of the camera right now, help me position the top before I nailed it down. And once again, I use my hulking body as a clamp while I nail these two parts together. It's always a good idea to chamfer MDF. Uh, a 90 degree sharp MDF corner is very fragile. Whereas if you just knock it off a little bit, it uh, greatly adds a durability and it also feels a little nicer on the hand. I also added a tiny little chamfer to these dog holes because they were just annoyingly sharp. Once again, I find myself using my very secret polyurethane formula. And no, don't ask, I'm not going to give you the ratio. I will take this information to my grave. And I like to use thinned polyurethane because I think it penetrates a little further into the MDF and then hardens and creates a real nice durable surface. And now it's time to uninstall the old workbench top and install the new one. But before installing the new one, let's take a closer look at this scissor lift. I've had a handful of viewers mistake this as a motorcycle lift. And while that's a good guess, uh, it's not right. This is actually a purpose-built work table. These lift tables are very expensive and very industrial. They are not built to a price point. And no, I don't make enough money to buy one of these new. I actually bought this at an estate sale for about one sixth of what it would cost new. And here's our undercarriage. Got some switches and tubes and wiring and all kinds of different stuff down there. But in reality, this is just an electric motor that runs a hydraulic ram. And it's operated with a foot pedal switch. And I'm not lying when I describe this tool as industrial. Each of the scissor legs are made from three quarter inch thick plate and the weldons at the joint are one inch thick. And if I were Canadian, I would most likely describe this table as skookum. Overall, it's been a really nice addition to the shop. I've used it on every single project since I bought it. And this may sound weird, but the best thing I could say about this table is nothing. It never gives me any problems. I never think about it. It just works day in and day out. This is a new location for my bench. And as you can see, there's a little wobble I need to solve. At this point, everything's built. Now it's time to just put it all together. And I started by putting the vacuum motor in first. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to get in and out. 
and I drilled a couple of holes behind the area where the dust is collected so that I could run the cord over to the other side of the bench. And on the other side of the bench, I mounted an automatic vacuum switch, so when I plug a tool in and turn it on, the vacuum will turn on. I also reinstalled the filter as well as the vacuum hose. And at some point, I'll need to make a little knob to be able to more easily pull this cover off. I don't know what these type of bolts are called, but they'll make it so that I won't bump a hex head when I'm taking tools in and out of the cubbies. And here's how I fixed the wobble. I took a 90 degree bracket and bent it around a washer. No more wobble and solid as a rock. Time for a test drive and surprisingly the vacuum works almost exactly as good as it did uh, before I took it out of its original home. And here's what it looks like to pull the vacuum out of storage and hook it up to a tool. Overall, it is pretty easy to pull this out and use it. And really at this point, I don't have any excuse to not use dust collection when I'm using a power tool at the bench. One issue I need to solve is hose management and the hose kind of wants to roll off the table. A clamp works, but I wouldn't mind coming up with something a little more convenient. And putting the hose away is equally as easy as taking it out. And my plan for cleanup is to clean the filter as I would any other filter, and then clean the dust out with a dedicated vacuum that I use for cleaning up my shop. And here's a demonstration of how I plan to use the 90 degree pattern of holes that I've created with two fences clamped in place. And the one that goes over top, I just used the Parf Guide system to drill those two holes. I can clamp a stop block in place, and now I can route a dado, I can use a biscuit joiner, etc., and I can do it repeatedly. After a few test cuts, I was really pleased. It's very accurate, and it's really easy to set up. This is kind of a no-brainer. Oh, and uh, also I just wanted to mention that I ordered the dust collection shroud for this router. So now setting up and cutting joinery that's in the middle of a panel will be quick and easy. As with all of my shop fixtures, this will be a work in progress. I'm sure there'll be some modifications I'll need to do to it in the future. And that's okay by me. I'm actually looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to making an already pretty darn good bench even better. I really enjoyed building this bench. Some of the engineering challenges were a great deal of fun to solve. And hopefully this benchtop will help me build better projects in the future. And why not? Let's finish it off with some immaturity. Thanks for watching. Till next time.